to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is... Who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. We're going to have an interesting hour, two hours tonight, where we're going to be talking about mythology and higher consciousness. So we get to mix the old in with the new, with metaphysical. So it's going to be a multitasking kind of event tonight. Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, energy healing, and psychic readings. So if there's stuff going on in your life, give me a call. It's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com, where you can jumpstart your intuition today by downloading their free 50-page guide. So if you've been thinking about changing careers and working in a holistic health field, check out the programs they offer, www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. So I just have one really, 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 really important announcement, especially if you're listening to the show now and you're kind of a night owl or an early bird. I'll be on uh, Coast to Coast this morning at 2 o'clock Central Time, 3 o'clock Eastern Time. Way too early for me, but I'll be on being bright and perky with George Norrie on Coast to Coast. So check it out. And we'll be talking about uh, my new book, E.T. Chronicles, the what myth and legend has to say about human origin, as well as icon deconstructing the archetypes of the ancients. So don't miss it. Coast to Coast AM, George Norrie, 2 AM to 4, or what is it? 3 to 5 Eastern Standard Time. Woohoo! Okay, let me tell you about today's guest, and we will bring him on the air. Paul Boudreau is an ecologist and biologist who studied ancient myth and sites, including on-site explorations of Egyptian temples, tombs, and the pyramids. Um, Ancient myths and site have captivated his imagination and attention since childhood, struggling to understand the importance of what was taught to him as fairy tales. He has been fortunate enough to travel the world and to personally experience many of man's highest creations, both ancient and modern. And today we're going to be talking about his new book, Awakening to Higher, Higher Consciousness, Guidance from Ancient Egypt and Sumner. So please welcome uh, Paul Boudreau. Hey, Paul, how are you? Just fine, Dr. Rita. Just fine. How are you doing? I am doing good. Did I say your name kind of right? You did an excellent job. Thank I congratulate you. you on that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a lot to talk about because there's just so much material in your book that um, I, I think we're going to have a great conversation. But let's just start off easy. It's your first time on the show. Mm-hmm. And we, maybe we can start with a little bit of history from you. What got you interested in studying ancient mythology, ancient cultures, and their relationship to consciousness in the first place? Um. Let's go back to the beginning, I guess. Let's uh, in the beginning. In the beginning, and we do talk about creation, that so it's a good place to start in the beginning. Personally, I, as a child, was told fairy tales and stories, biblical stories, that struck me as 
absurd, if I can use the word. Um, you know, Genesis talking about naked people running around the garden with talking snake and things like that. And I, I don't know where it came from in me, but I always thought there had to be something more to these, these myths, these stories that, that obviously were cherished by the people telling me the stories. And I, I, you know, I knew enough history that I knew they, they, they reached back in time to the beginning of civilization. So wh why, why were these stories important? And I guess it just started from there in, in, in terms of my own interest. Now, as I, I went through university and I, I managed to get a job and I was very fortunate to meet Lloyd, uh, my, my mentor, my, my friend. And we sort of started talking about these issues about, you know, the, the, the things we, we heard as, as children. And uh, we connected on this, the, this common experience of, my gosh, these people are either stupid or <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. And, and this gave rise to a, a common interest that we, that we shared about, well, let's, let's dig into this as scientists and, and, and try to explore whether whether it, there is something more to these myths. So it's been a lifelong curiosity, a lifelong uh, question of mine as to how can I make these myths more useful to me? So why do you think that mythology and these type of stories have endured for so long? I mean, some of them are ancient, ancient, ancient. Yeah, we the stories we deal with are, are myths from five thousand years ago. Um, uh, you know, some of the, the the literature that we talk about is is the very first literature that we know of uh, as a human civilization. Why they're important? Um, you know, they, they are all good stories, and I think you know we maybe we'll talk a bit more later on about you know levels of interpretation. But you know, they're all great stories. Uh, we talk about uh, Gilgamesh, and, and we talk about Genesis, and and I think that's the that's a key piece to to these the success of these stories is that they really engage us, and and you don't have to be educated to 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 be entertained by them and by be engaged um do you know the the the, the nursery rhyme uh, ring around the rosy mm -hmm. did you play that game as a, as a kid oh yeah yeah, yeah. so so did i and, and uh, you know it, it was great fun and we'd all fall down and then we'd pick ourselves up and laugh and do it again well, it took decades before I was uh, able to, to, to find a, a reference that, that uh, uh, pointed out that that nursery rhyme is, is the story of the great plagues in the 1600s in Europe. The, you know, Acha Acha is the, the people sneezing and then they all fall down dead. They all fall down dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, so, and I think it was the posies because it, there was so much stench that they would put posies and flowers in their pockets or something so that it would give them a better odor. You're, you're on your game. Absolutely. So uh, how could a, a story about the Great Plague still be active today in schoolyards in Western, uh, Western civilization? Obviously, it, it, it is. And, and part of that has to do, well, it's a fun game to fall over <laughs> as a kid. Not so much mm -hmm. when you get older. <laughs> so uh, a, a big part of, of the success of these myths and, and the transfer of knowledge has to do with, it's just, you know, good old fun. It's, it's engaging and they're interesting, you know, the, the stories of the hero doing great things. So that, that's easy to see. That the challenge that, that Lloyd and I encountered when we, we started this exploration journey, I don't know what we want to call it, had to do with... Um, kind of verifying for ourselves that, that myths actually contain information, can, contain real information, contain important information. And we started uh, with a book called Hamlet's Mill by de Santillana and Von Dishen. Do you know this book? It's a real tome. It, it I, I mean, like, I've heard the title, but I've never read it. Right. Well, it, it's a very long, serious discussion that explores uh, the, the you know Shakespearean play Hamlet and, and the story of Hamlet tied to the the, the movement of the earth and the in the universe, and uh, they do an excellent job of uh, of showing that in fact Hamlet's mill, the myths associated with it, 
uh, did contain or do, does contain real astrological, astronomical information that, that is carried down through the myth, even though it's not readily apparent um, in, in reading the myth itself. So I, that was part of what got us started in this, 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 this exploration of creation myths that, that okay, these myths are more than just fairy tales, more than just stories of long, long ago and far, far away. Um, and, and that was a big, big help to us in, in, in sort of our take on, on what the myths mean to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but you're mentioning Hamlet. And I mean, Hamlet was written by Shakespeare. And so I don't, I don't know if when Shakespeare wrote it, he based it on some mythology from somewhere or whatever. Um, but that obviously was a work of fiction. And w one question I have for you is, yeah. what do you think about myths? Do you think mythology, that there's fact to mythology um, on one level? I mean, obviously, <laughs> I mean, I believe that there are multiple levels in the mythology. So we'll get to that part right. later. Um, but do you think that there is truth to the myths that we read, especially some of these old creation myths? There's a, uh, another uh, there's a, uh, another book called, um, authored by Barbara and Barbara. I, I won't spend the whole night reciting references. They're all on our website, etc. But but uh, this other book looked at um, myths about uh, oh from from the point of geology, and they were looking. Uh, I'm trying to recall a, a sort of a, a myths about giants with uh, red hair. Uh, that slept in caves that shook the ground, and, and uh, it's it, it's actually much. It's a, not a bad read. This 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 book that. Okay, what book is that? Because now I want it. It's authored by Barber and Barber, and I don't have the title in front of me. We'll have to do some social media stuff afterwards. Okay. Um, and they look at at uh, at the links between earthquakes and volcanoes with uh, some of the mythical stories. And so when you've got a red-haired uh, giant shaking the ground, uh, they look back, I think they were looking from a Greek point of view or something, but they were looking at a great uh, volcanic eruption in the Mediterranean, which uh, yeah, I'm getting at, at, at the very extreme edge of my, my, my expertise here. <laughs> um, but it, it, again, it was, it, it was enjoyable to sort of see how they presented some of the myths in terms of real geological information. And, and uh, uh, so, yeah, absolutely. They, they contain information at, at many different levels from, from earthquakes and, and volcanic eruptions to, uh, to what Lloyd and I have worked on in terms of uh, sort of self-development and, and uh, how we might look at the world around us. Um, and and the, the, the book about the geology makes the point that, you know, it, the myths have to be simple, they have to, you know, there's a number of aspects that make a myth succeed over the long term. You know, if you've got, you know, hundreds of names and complicated dialogue, that's not going to convey well. So it, the myths tend to, to, to simplify and, and, and focus on just a few uh, very dynamic and interesting people, and uh, so there's lots of myths that that uh, we haven't really gotten into in our book. But uh, I think there's a lot more we have to learn, and, and we should pay attention to. You obviously haven't read any Indian myths where you have to sit there with your computer on to look up these <laughs> names and who they are and what they represent. It's just like a research project just to make it through a page. Uh, no, <laughs> I haven't done that yet. Uh, maybe it appeals to the culture. I, I don't know. Uh, they got a million people all over the place. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because yeah. you read this thing and you think, oh, well, that's just. You just kind of go by the name and just ignore it. But then you find out that, like, this word here actually is talking about people that live in a fairy realm, you know, mm -hmm. or in a neither, in the neither world. But you wouldn't really get that unless you looked it up. And it's not necessarily relevant on one level to reading the story. But if you know that, then it kind of takes it to a different place. But anyway, 
I, I digress. Let me go back to my question. <laughs> so one of the things that I noticed was that you utilize, and I, I didn't write this question down, but the ECSL, where they have C-S-L. the Sumerian, the Sumerian uh, documents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it, it looked like you had gone through a bunch of the material they have on there, which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't you find it interesting how scandalous some of their myths were? <laughs> scandalous what are you thinking <laughs> well you know like Enlil raping this woman or you know these these stories of intrigue that come down to us that I would get back to the last point what, what that catches your attention right that makes I mean we all love gossip and intrigue um, I hadn't thought about scandalous as a description I like scandalous. <laughs> Good soap opera. <laughs> well, and, and Gilgamesh did the same thing. He was, you know, uh, taking young brides and, uh, you know, and, and taking their virginity and such. So it, it is an aspect. Uh, a good myth has all sorts of levels, and and uh, and uh, we shouldn't be too moral. Well, I try not to be too moralistic. But, I mean, uh, try not to judge these myths. Scandalous! A couple of naked people running around the garden escape is, is scandalous for some people. Well, yeah, I just think, you know, and I'd like your opinion, but I feel like we learn a lot about the society and culture in reading these myths, and so you read stories like that, and it's like, God, they were doing stuff like that back then too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, back then, we're, you know, even over five thousand years, we're, I don't think we're that much different than than the people that wrote these stories down. So, there's a lot of stuff going on today that that probably wouldn't have ba- wouldn't have raised an eyebrow back in Sumer, and vice versa. Yeah. You know, but going back to my my comment, I mean, do you feel like myths provide us with insights into a society? Oh yes, absolutely. And and uh, you know, the the myths capture a, a, a snapshot of, of the society. You know, Gilgamesh was written by the Sumerians and and not written down in in total until the Babylonians a thousand years later. And by the time the Babylonians got their hands on it. It was much more warlike, and and you know it had different aspects that that you you don't find in the uh, in the Sumerian uh, text, the original Sumerian text. So definitely, it it, it changes, and and uh, in more recent times, uh, some of the things that we we explore are easily found in Christianity, but Christianity presents them in a certain way and, and, and in a, di- a certain light. So, yeah, absolutely, the society is reflected in the myths, and the myths re- reflect the, 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 uh, the society. And you get to know the people, and you get to know what they value, it seems to me. If you can, if you can understand the message, yes. Uh, the... Uh, I always think of you know reading the sports page you know and and so not so much now but you know a team one team would clobber another one and you know if you just read the literal sports page at some point you'd think that we were a bloodthirsty culture where we just you know set teams to kill each other so language communication is is always an issue whether you're talking about your present day or whether you're trying to reach back in time to a different culture. It, 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 it's not readily apparent uh, sometimes what, what was actually being recorded in, in, in the ancient myths and in their, uh, in, in their language. And, and I expect the same will happen, you know, 5,000 years from now when someone tries to understand what the Western world has been writing at. So there are insights, and, but one has to work at it. One has to be a bit careful, I think, not to get... Uh, uh, to be aware of this, be be sensitive to uh, to what we what we know about uh, these people. Uh, an example: uh, the Egyptian culture is often presented as being a funerary culture. You know that all they worried about was um, uh, death and funerals and you know and dead people. Uh, but our work, we find much more written and represented in pictures that has to do with. A lot with life, uh, with, with uh, you know living, with with higher consciousness. Uh, an example is uh, you probably know the, the the text that has been called the Book of the Dead, right? 
Everybody knows the Book of the Dead title. Yeah, I read it. <laughs> cover to cover, I bet. Yeah. But its real title is The Book of Coming Forth by Day, or Book of Coming Forth by Light. And that, that title is quite different than The Book of the Dead. Uh, gives a different impression. It, it would set the tone of how you would approach the, this text. And, and so, in, in this case, the earlier, the early uh, uh, explorers, investigators, misnamed it, uh, and I think that as a result, that whole genre of literature, that whole uh, book, the the book ha has been sort of uh, treated as dealing with something I don't think that the Egyptians were that concerned with. Now, no doubt, I mean, definitely the Egyptians, they had tombs, they had a lot of tombs, and Lloyd and I have been in a number of them, but they also had temples where people prayed and celebrated. Uh, pyramids are a whole other thing that we may get to later in the conversation. But uh, definitely they weren't only interested in dead people, and uh, we, we find that very exciting. I think they have a lot to, to tell us about live people, and me, and you, and how we can be more alive. So that's an example of, of you know how difficult it is to find out exactly you know, to try to imagine what those cultures were like. And what about translation? I uh, I, I find it interesting because all right, this is, I, I don't even care. It's like I like the Watchtower translation of the Bible. I don't know what it is about <laughs> it, but I like that translation. Okay. And I will use it if I'm pulling out a biblical passage, usually an Old Testament passage, to put into an article or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, oh, my God, I get these comments from people, but that's not a King James Version. It's like, it's the freaking Bible. <laughs> but from your study, because I, I see that you have looked into the linguistics and that part, um, how much does translation from one version, one language to another really impact the message that we get in English? Oh, it's, it's huge. Um, the, the guidance that we, 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 we provide is, is really one has to look interior to find out what relates to themselves personally. So I can understand you having you know, a particular translation which connects with you, and that, that is the most important thing. Uh, for all of the, these myths, you know, we can, we can see the, the actual Sumerian letters on the, this website you mentioned, the Electronic Textual Corpses of Sumerian Language, ETCSL, and I invite listeners to do a Google search on ETCSL. And you can see the letters, and you, you, know, you can see the translations, and, and one of the things we've done is to sort of go and, and try to make that comparison. Similarly with the pyramid texts, uh, this is the you know, earliest literature known to man, written down by the Egyptians inside the, the earliest pyramids they ever wrote. Uh, you could do a Google search on, for pyramid texts online and you could, you could actually see the, the, the images, the hieroglyphics, and you could see the translation. Uh, one has to continually work to, to try to really get to the root of these, these myths, and, and English uh, is the language we speak, and it's the language we, we, we uh, understand the world in. Uh, but that translation from, from one language to another is, is, you know, it's not like pulling up a, 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 a dictionary and, and flipping to, to various pages and, and figuring it out. I think it, it takes a lot of life experience, a lot of, you know, direct experience of what you've experienced, you know, uh, what you can remember in your own life, and and we think that's the ground grounding that's needed when one approaches these ancient ancient myths, because we do think that they tie directly to what we have lived through. Uh, quite different than an academic study, you know, where you know one has six or seven different translations, and one could argue about the different usage through time. Uh, that's potentially very useful, but it's not particularly interesting to us at this point in terms of how we would apply the myths to ourselves. Um, yeah. But I could see where there might be, you know, since we're going to be moving into consciousness eventually, um, where there might be a word that would translate, you know, in 
to maybe me or you to represent like a higher level of conscious mind. And and the person just puts mind. And so it, you know, the <laughs> the intention yep. doesn't translate correctly or, you know, the bias of the writer doesn't have that experience to under, really understand what the concept is or whatever gets put into this text. And now everyone goes, oh, you know, and, and, and they, they lose the message. Yeah. That in, in, in Canada, I'm sure you may have heard this, that, you know, the, the Inuit that live up north have 35 different words for snow, whereas down here, uh, snow is snow. snow. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that, that's exactly the, the 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 point I believe, and when you get to things like bodies and 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 consciousness, uh, it, it's really not that easy. Uh, you know, a body, a live body, dead body, corpse, body, you know, a being, a human. Uh, so it, it persists in, in English and, and in all languages. And and you're right, it it's not sometimes not obvious. Uh, what what is meant by the authors, nor what what one could take away from it. Um, uh, it's one of the biggest challenges of of the Egyptian. It it, it is a very difficult language. Uh, Lloyd has uh, studied, um, had taken several years of study on, on on Egyptian hieroglyphs, and and it was a great well, it was essential to our visits to Egypt to uh, to to read the hieroglyphs and uh, and put it together because there's. And there's just you know one hieroglyph contains so much information uh, that a, an English word may or may not have that uh, yeah it's 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 tough it, it's tough and uh, uh, our our own advice to ourselves is don't be fooled by the the first literal meaning because that's probably not what they were they weren't protecting these myths for five thousand years because of you know some literal meaning they were generally me trying to deal with very difficult topics. We we think that that the ancient Sumerians and ancient Egyptians were struggling with communication and language much the way we do now. Uh, consciousness, awake, death. Uh, even today, we we don't have a very very good handle on on what some of these concepts mean. Uh, there's been a lot of written recently about you know CT scans and MRIs for watching brain function. I'm not sure that's going to get us anywhere to know that, oh yeah, those electrons fired in your brain. I don't, you know, the medical approach may not help us very much with understanding what we are as being, you know, what makes me alive right now. And when I die, if I die, or when I die, you know, what, what's, what's the big difference between a living person and a dead person? Is it electrons? I, I don't think so. Me either. <laughs> Good. I don't think that it's part of this three-dimensional world, or we wouldn't have so many situations of non-locality happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a lot we have to learn, and, and uh, you know, it's a great time. It's a great, interesting time to be working on, on the work of the ancients, and, and I know you've had guests looking at a lot of the archaeological and, and construction stuff, uh, you know, shock in his work dating the Sphinx to 10,000 years ago, and Bouval and, and, and John Anthony West on the Giza Plateau, and Scranton on his Dogon. And really fascinating. Now you've got Hancock and Andrew Collins looking at the Gobekli Tepe from 10,000 years ago. And I think, well, we, we're all sort of exploring uh, the edges of, of what we know about civilization. Now, Lloyd and I are looking at, at the written piece, but there's all these pieces being tossed around and, and we're all trying to figure out what, what's, uh, what, what is our history and, and, and how we've gotten to where we are. And um, I think there's still a, a lot to learn, both from language, from, from just even knowing how people lived that, that long ago. One of, the, and, and, oh, sorry. one of the interesting things about the Be Gobekli Tepe um, is I understand people believe it was built by hunter-gatherers. And well, I don't, not really, but... Well, the, tell me what you know. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what the scientists say, and then there's everybody else that go, right, sure. <laughs> and we then we'll build the pyramids next week. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but we don't know. I mean, you know, we don't, we don't know. We don't know, and and that that's what makes it so interesting. And and the, and the same thing with literature. We're trying to look at literature in a way that we don't really know or haven't known what the, what these myths have been about. And and uh, uh, can't believe that they were about dead people. <laughs> Sorry to come back to that point. <laughs> Well, they might have been alive at one point in time, but after 5,000 years, I mean, unless they're a god, then, you know, they're possibly dead by now. Well, they're dead Unless by they now. reincarnated, you know. And that's possible, too. Uh, that, that's possible, <laughs> too. Uh, but, but the myths have so much more power imagining them or seeing them in terms of being given to a, a live person, whether it's a shaman or someone, you know, that's being initiated into higher knowledge. To me, that's much more exciting and interesting and mysterious than thinking that there were prayers said over a dead body, which is more, you know, the, the Western Christian view of things. Well, we but if you look, I mean, I do ghost hunting, so of course I have mm -hmm. to look at the whole concept of ghosts from an antiquity point of view and where we really started believing in ghosts, mm -hmm. the notion of ghosts, mm -hmm. and there's like this whole thing. And so some of the rituals were so that the person who died wouldn't come back and haunt them, which is mm -hmm. why there was, a, from my understanding, a lot of death rituals is to ensure they stayed in the grave. <laughs> Put them away. And, 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 and moved on, you know, go to the light, <laughs> Pharaoh, go to the light. <laughs> 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 Absolutely, that may, that makes sense. But then at the same time, we, we know of a lot of certainly the, the First Nations people in, in North America, you know, the, the, the shamanistic tradition was was still very active when the, when the Europeans arrived in terms of, you know, uh, specific individuals in, in the group that were connected on a different plane or, you know, had, had, they had, they had different training and connections that that were were connected while they were alive, not not you know they, they, they maybe they were talking to ghosts, but you know certainly they were you know respected and and uh, played a large role in 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 the day to day life of of the civilization. We don't have that these days. That, well, maybe maybe you're as close as we come to it. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, and that's the part that I always, you know, I have this whole list of questions, but I'm just going to go off topic here or, or off my list. Um, that's the part that I find the most fascinating is that when we go back into deep antiquity, there mm -hmm. is such a understanding and such a reverence and such a connection mm -hmm. to that mm -hmm. unseen world and a deep understanding of how to connect with it and interact with it. That we have, com I don't want to say completely lost, but mm -hmm. in most parts of the world, we've completely lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th that's a good example of, of seeing those civilizations as, as valuing it differently than we do today. I mean, they, they, they have left lots of images and, and literature and writing that uh, that supports the idea that that you know the netherworld was very real to them and and uh, uh, the gods were real they interacted with the gods right i mean it wasn't some old man on a cloud it was something that was much more personal and, and participated in their lives so yes that's that that is something that progress and engineering doesn't really support in modern day world i mean i think it's been brainwashed out of us but i, I find it interesting because there are so many people now wanting to see ghosts or tap into their intuition or we have the quantum physicists talking about non-locality and uh, mm -hmm. you know string theory and and all of these things that you know multiple dimensions and you know mm -hmm. and i joke around i'm like go to the metaphysical bookstore <laughs> and there's some really great books that i think you should read and then come back and, and attack your theory again Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like it's information that we've already known. And we don't know how to deal with it uh, in an engineering world. Uh, and, and, you know, quantum, quantum physics, quantum mechanics are as weird as any ghost story I've ever heard. Non-locality and wave particle. 
Uh, I'm, I'm surprised. Half that, dead cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, dead or dead or alive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm surprised that that that, that the, the physics studies of, of the early 19th century haven't had more of an impact. We we still. Uh, you know, we still think gravity is an attractive force, and, and maybe that's because warping the time-space continuum is too difficult to get our ha get our heads around. But it hasn't doesn't seem to have made many people that much more open to the uh, th these kind of intangible uh, aspects of life that that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And and physics is you know that's got to be as tangible as anything. If that can't do it, then why are we so uh, quick to judge? Physics is tangible. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seemed to be. Uh, you know, you, you knock your hand on the desk and you think you're hitting solid wood, where in fact it's mainly space. You know, <laughs> there are another side issue that. that uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, we'll just move on. Um, yeah. <laughs> earlier, you you mentioned a number of different researchers, and one of them was Larry Scranton, and. Um, in his work on the Dogon cosmology, he proposes that each letter that forms a hieroglyphic or, you know, a hieroglyphic word mm -hmm. um, has a, a meaning. And then if you look at the word, the individual words that are grouped together, that the group of symbols provides the reader with a description of the word such as, and I was supposed to look this up, but I didn't, such as NASA. You know, we say NASA, but it's National Aeronautics Space Agency. Yeah. Agency. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your studies, do you think that the hieroglyphics or the Sumerian symbols, uh, the cuneiform, um, that there is an intrinsic meaning to each of their symbols as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, to think of a hieroglyph automatically, I think that it has many levels of meaning and, and, and uh, to the point where the placement of the hieroglyph to other hieroglyphs is important. In the book, we, we talk about, uh, uh, from the Genesis story, the, the, the two fruits on the two, the fruit on the two trees, and, and uh, one is in our interpretation, one is uh, ha hets and the other one's hets ha. Same syllables, but because the reversed, uh, one implies that one is eating from a, a fruit that sustains being over, you know, your physical life, and the other one is just going to support your physical life. So uh, definitely the, these, these symbols, these hieroglyphs are, are just jam-packed with this symbology, this, this, this uh, information and uh, it's not only what they what the, the symbol means but where where it is in relation to other symbols and, and yeah it's 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 quite a quite interesting way of, of containing information whereas we see uh, the letter a and it's just you know it's a placeholder uh, mm -hmm. the, the hieroglyphs uh, were, were used quite differently and uh, one can understand that it would take a lifetime for a scribe in ancient Egypt to appreciate what these symbols mean and how the proper use of the symbols, uh, what is the proper use of these symbols. And, and be, through that, there's a lot of information that could be contained in a very small, uh, you know, a small number of hieroglyphs. The challenge is teasing out all that information uh, so that it makes sense to you. But it makes me wonder if part of where we, and I'm going to say, went wrong was creating this separation between the meaning of, the intrinsic meaning of the letters and the intrinsic meaning of the symbols to just a placeholder. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't know where that, that, that originated from. Um, uh, I, I blame a lot of our modern day misconceptions on the Greeks, and I don't know if this is another case where I should be uh, <laughs> <laughs> complaining again about the Greeks or not. Uh, the Greek, you know, much of our modern day culture is tra tra traced back to the Greeks, and, you know, democracy was invented by the Greeks. But in fact, many of the early Greek philosophers were trained in Egypt. Uh, we just didn't, we're not taught that. We don't, we don't know that. Uh, we don't generally know that. Um, 
So, you know, the, the, some of the intermediate, inter, intermediate civilizations certainly have influenced what we've received from the ancient cultures. Um, and it's, you know, again, it's hard to uh, sort out who said what, when, and, and why they said it. Um, uh, I, I don't know where placeholders uh, came about in terms of an alphabet. Well, I mean, because even Judaism has intrinsic meaning, uh, Hebrew mm -hmm. has intrinsic yeah. meaning to their letters, mm -hmm. runes have intrinsic meaning to their letters, yeah. and I don't, you know, we can blame it all on the Phoenicians. Mm -hmm. I like the Phoenicians. <laughs> I know, but didn't they, aren't they the first ones to come up with like an alphabet, alphabet? Uh, yeah. We'll but blame yeah. them. Okay. And they were everywhere. Uh, they did travel all over the world, uh, and they did pass a lot of their information on to the Greeks as well. So, and we don't really know any of their names, so it's all good. <laughs> um, the only Phoenician I know named is Parmenides, who is some. He's, he's claimed to be Greek, but he was actually a Phoenician that that came out of. Uh, and the Turkey when when the things uh, went bad. So, but you're right. There there isn't a whole lot known about uh, about the individuals and uh, um, yeah, maybe they were the ones that put placeholders. But uh, I'll have to I'll have to look into that a bit more. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's kind of shift gear and spend some time in the beginning mm -hmm. and talk about some creation myths. Mm -hmm. So in your investigation. Have you found parallels between the Bible and other creation stories? I'd flip it around. The Bible is very derivative. It came out. It was compiled around the time of the Greeks, sort of two thousand years after the Sumerian and ancient Egyptians were writing about the netherworld, writing about the flood, writing about separation from heaven and earth and water from, from land and those sorts of things. So, depending how you look at it, uh, I, I don't... Uh, the, the Bible came much later, and absolutely, the, the, many of the, the principal images uh, came from, from cultures and civilizations that predated uh, Christianity by... Um, by 2,000 years. Uh, the challenge is uh, keeping in mind that uh, the Old Testament of the Bible uh, really had to do with the Abraham lineage, uh, which was kind of shared by Sumerian and Egyptians. Um, so, it, you know, it's easy to, it, yeah, it's quite easy to, to go back, and, and the flood is definitely comes from Samaria, the tale of Gilgamesh. Uh, 3,000, 2,500 years BC, um, and and has been included in, in a number of different literatures right th right up into the Bible. Um, the Sumerian uh, creation myth that, that we, uh, we we mention in in the book has to do with you know the initial separating heaven from earth uh, again, 2,000, 3,000 years BC. These ideas were well developed long before uh, you know Christianity took hold. The the Sumerian culture is an amazing culture that that Western world really doesn't know much about, and, and I think that's a real uh, a real misfortune because uh, in in Sumer uh, they had literature, they were writing, they had written language, they had libraries, they they wrote laws, and and where most of us are taught that. Hammurabi, the Babylonian, created the first code of law. Well, the Sumerians did it a thousand years before that. So there's a lot in, in the Sumerian culture that, that I think, well, there's a lot that we should pay more attention to as uh, providing uh, the initial roots for a lot of these thoughts. So, you know, if I think about the Bible, mm -hmm. um, you know, just that creation, you know, Genesis 1 through whatever. Mm -hmm. um, First five you know, books so. Well, no, I'm just talking about like Genesis 1 through 10 or I don't know, I would have to look it up. Okay, you know, yeah. in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was waste and void and darkness covered the abyss and the spirit of God floated across the waters. And then God said, let there be light. Mm -hmm. Boom. 
and there was light. And see, and that's just from memory, and that's bad. That's really scary when you can just pull that one out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I, can, I can read you the uh, the Sumerian equivalent from 2,000 years before the Bible. It's, okay. I can read that. The Sumerian creation myth starts, In days of yore, in the distant days of yore, in nights of yore, in the far-off nights of yore, in the years of yore, in the distant years of yore, when necessary things had been brought into manifest existence, when the necess necessary things had been for the first time set in order, when bread had been tasted for the first time in the shrines of the land, when the ovens of the land had been made to work, when the heavens had been separated from earth, when earth had been delimited from the heavens, when the fame of mankind had been established. And it goes on. Doesn't that sound familiar? It does sound familiar. Mm. But I think it's interesting where it even is making reference to a time prior to the formation of anything, much less the earth. You know, kind of going back and I'll, go, you know, use a mm -hmm. kind of like the, you know, going back to the Big Bang or whatever mm -hmm. it was, you know, making reference to that. Let's shift gears a bit then. Okay. Uh, the way Lloyd and I present it is what it's talking about is the creation of me out of a void. So I'm the void. So I'm that homogenous, undifferentiated thing, that mass. And what we what we see in the creation myths is an excellent description of what goes into me as moving from that void into something that has being, something that's separated from the world, whether it's heaven from earth, mind from body, soul from spirit. We don't see them as talking about physical things or physicality so much as, oh yeah, it's talking about those early moments of awakening when I was a barely a kid and I remember waking up to seeing myself and I was and we see that this differentiation between heavens and earth and, and, and land and water in other cases has to do with those early moments of awakening to, holy cow, I'm alive and I'm here. And I've got, well, more than I've got toes, but I've got, you know, I can see that I'm hungry at times and, you know, all the things that, that we, we, we eventually uh, learn about ourselves. So that's our take on, on, on creation myths in terms of its Telling it is providing us with a language that helps us to see our own development, and it may be about creation of physical worlds. But in our in our interests, it, there's much more to be gained by applying it to ourselves and saying, "Oh yeah, I'm awake. You know, I was awake at a time, and I wasn't before." And uh, so yeah, that's the shifting gears. Is that I th we think of it more as a uh, sort of an internal uh, creation of myself, not an external world. I mean, that's a really interesting concept or a really interesting perspective on it. Um, and, and you're relating that to consciousness or are you relating that to the whole, I'm going to say, just for lack of better words, uh, experience on the third dimensional plane? You know, the conscious awareness as well as the physical aware, you know, physical being mm -hmm. here. I, yeah. All of that? I, I well let me let me let me tell a little story about when okay. I when I was very young, uh, preschool age. Uh, I, I, it was Christmas time, and I had my nose pressed up to the glass, and Santa Claus walked down the street. And to this day, I still have a, an incredibly an incredible feeling of awakening at that time. I, I saw Santa Claus and, and in addition to seeing all my gifts you know, go flying out the window because I wasn't in bed and Santa Claus was around, but I remember that moment, uh, it was the first time I remember being Paul. I was awake and I separated myself from all the things were, that, that had gone around me. Now at that point in time, I, I, I I hadn't even gone to school. I, I mean, you know, consciousness, philosophy, you know, those things didn't exist. But that movement existed. And, and it, it probably led to much of what I've 
studied since then, trying to understand what that moment was when I woke up. And I wasn't awake before then, and I was for the moment, and such is life, I, I, went, <laughs> I probably went back to sleep again because I, I got hungry or something. So that, that's, you know, that, that's my struggle to communicate to you what that was. And, and to me, that was creation. It was creation in, in, a, in, a, in, in a way that was very direct and very personal. And I, I probably had a few moments of that since then, but that was the first one. And, and uh, that was my first, first point of being me, I guess. And so you were able to identify kind of your soul in that moment? Like you were able to be you fully present in that moment. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, before that moment, I was a void. I was just, you know, there was, uh, I mean, I was a kid, obviously. and But at that point, uh, something changed and... and uh, uh, and I'm still, I'm probably still trying to figure that out. That's probably why we got into myths and their, uh, their ability to describe some of these processes in us that, that we really don't have the words for uh, in, in, in modern day, day world. Um, uh, we think that the ancients were struggling in the same way we are today to try to describe those moments of awakening in our lives that we really don't have good good description for. I mean, if I, if I told you this morning I was on the back deck in the sunshine and had a, had a crisp apple which tasted sweet, you'd have a pretty good sense of what, what I was experiencing, even though we've you know, never met. To talk about consciousness or being or soul, uh, I, I, I still struggle with the, the kind of words that, that make any sense to me as well as to somebody else. And we think that the myths provide us with some examples of, of uh, some of that description. Can you give another example? Do we find anything that comes out of maybe Egyptian cosmology to give us another insight into that? Um, another story we deal with is Gilgamesh. Uh, this is the Sumerian myth that was written down by the Babylonians. And, uh, I love we, Gilgamesh. Do you? Oh, it's mm -hmm. a great story. I mean, and it led to Hercules and, and all sorts of other later later stories. Uh, Gilgamesh story basically is uh, the story about a demigod, someone, you know, God. Wow, he's pretty powerful. Even if he's half a god, he's still pretty powerful. Um, but he's wrecking havoc in, in, in his homeland, and, and he's, you know, taking young brides to bed before they get with their husbands. and. And so the solution uh, that is put in place is that they, they partner the demigod up with uh, Enkidu. And Enkidu is, you know, a hairy uh, uh, person being from, from the forest. And together, the, the god and the animal side, are, they do great things. They cut down, uh, for, they cut down the forest and they, they kill the bull of heaven. And, uh, but eventually Enkidu, the animal side, dies and, and Gilgamesh has a, a strong desire for immortality. And he goes on and he does great things and eventually he ends up with the flower which holds the key to his immortality. Uh, his whole life he's worked for this and he, now he has it in his hand. And towards the end of the story, what does Gilgamesh do? But he lies down beside a pool and goes to sleep and a snake snatches the flower and he, and he loses his chance at immortality. F from my point of view, that describes so many instances in my life where I set out to, whether it's pay attention to my breathing or, you know, sense my lower body or, and ultimately when I think I'm getting close to success, I go to sleep and I get lost either by ambition or ego. And so that, that's one of the aspects of the Gilgamesh story that we tease out, is, is this, um, this difficulty of even a demigod to sort of stick with an intention to, 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 uh, to something that's very important to him. And, and we feel that the story of Gilgamesh really captures that whole aspect of, of my own desire to improve and, and you know, awaken. Uh, so that, you know, I spend most of my life asleep, maybe, I think most people do. Uh, and, and the story seems to give us some language to explain why. Well, I know it explains it, but at least puts it out there in black and white. You're likely to fall asleep at the moment you need to be awake, and uh, 
and off will go your flower of immortality, and, and uh, you'll be back to where you, be, you were to begin with. Yeah, I just keep going back to that's one of the earliest places where we find out that they had a belief in ghosts. Sorry, don't mean to go there, but I'm going there. <laughs> uh, that, I'm not against <laughs> ghosts. No, I don't know. You keep you were talking about the dead stuff, so now I'm like well, on this ghost thing. Sorry. Uh, um, yeah, are ghosts dead? They seem pretty alive, aren't they? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, to me, um, yeah. You know, but one of the things about the uh, Gilgamesh story is that it's it's kind of like the hero's journey, you know, mm -hmm. and he has to achieve certain things in order to get his just desserts, um, with, but, you know, but it does have that very ironic ending, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of like, you know, the modern day cliffhanger. It's like, okay, so what's he going to do next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that hero journey is, is my journey. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's what we, that's, you know, how can I be a full person? How can I, have, have, uh, you know, uh, you know, you mentioned consciousness, and, and uh, maybe this is a time to point out that we don't define consciousness in the book, because in fact, we're not talking about awakening highest consciousness, we're talking about awakening higher consciousness. And this recognizes the fact that we do spend most of our life asleep. We, you know, we're hungry, so we eat something, or, you know, tired, we go to bed. But you know, what I was saying earlier, that there are moments when I'm more than that. So wh why the difference? Why can't I live, you know, at that higher level all the time? And uh, the hero's journey is, it, it, you know, I think it's in some ways more difficult to be awake right now as as it would be to cut down a forest. Uh, we, we we feel that the, the the ancients were trying to capture these subtle processes that go on in us that, in a way that helps us recognize them as real processes and also help us try to pay attention, pay more attention to them. So maybe I'll be a bit, little bit more awake. Maybe I'll be a little bit more conscious. Do you think our ancestors were able to recognize that part of the story? Definitely you know, that, some, that some deeper do. meaning to it? Yeah, I think there's always exceptional people around that are aware of this. I mean, uh, you know, I've met some people in, that in my life that you know they were they were very you know they they had being they had presence they um, uh, they had more substance than than other people I had met. Um, whether there were more of those people long ago than now, I you know that that's kind of speculative. I I don't really know, but certainly there were enough of them back then to. To, to capture these images in the, in the kind of phrase that I read and the literature that they wrote so that it was preserved and, and you know, whether we encounter it in the Bible as, as the Bible story or whether we encounter it in Sumerian or Egyptian hieroglyphs, somebody also obviously knew this was important enough to, uh, uh, to keep around, yeah. No, you know, but I, I guess I'm just getting a little bit stuck because if it was uh, important to just a finite group of people, then why would a population keep reiterating, like the Gilgamesh story, I don't remember mm -hmm. how many different fragments they found mm -hmm. of it where they were finally able to put the whole story together. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there are multiple, multiple, multiple copies of it generated and so it seems like it was a popular narrative as well uh, yeah and it, I, I understand it was uh, sort of an oral tradition it, it was just spoken by these amazing people in, in, the, in the, the, the caucus region you know these people could remember you know thousands of phrases and they would get together and, and this was the early early replacement for television whereas you know the, the, these people would come and recite the story verbatim you know every every couple of you know, I know every month or, you know, every season sort of thing. So a good myth has, uh, you know, ha has those raunchy pieces. They also have the higher pieces. And uh, um, I think if you're just interested in entertainment, I think one will focus on, on the raunchy pieces 
if you if you're in search of something more uh, the most good myths all good myths would have something more to offer you in terms of your your training and your your uh, education well on that note we need to go to break <laughs> sounds good Okay. I'm Dr. Rita Louise. We're here talking to Paul Boudreaux about his book, Awakening Higher Consciousness. Uh, his webpage is www.awhico. That's awhico.com. And we'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. You're listening to IRN, the Inception Radio Network, Chicago, Illinois. Hello, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Remember, you can take your Inception Radio shows on the go. Just download the Inception Radio Network app for your iPhone, iPad, or Android smartphones and access live shows, past shows, guest lineups, and much more. Just visit the iTunes Store or the Google Play Marketplace and download it today for free. Who were the gods of antiquity? They've been described as the forces of nature, levels of consciousness, and aspects of our psyche. Stories that depict their incredible weapons, their flying machines, and their amazing adventures are characterized as being the product of our ancestors' fanciful imaginations. But what if the tales of the gods are true? Did the writers, chroniclers, and scribes of our distant past actually document a realistic view of our origin? My latest book, Man Made, The Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods, looks at our most ancient legends. Learn of the torrid romances, elaborate plots, violent scandals, and conspiracies that played out in antiquity. Find out the role the gods played in the life and culture we have today. If you want to find out the truth of who we are and where we come from, order your copy of Man Made today. For more information, go to www.manmadethechronicles.com. That's www.manmadethechronicles.com. You didn't forget what's coming up tonight, did you? Hi, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Never miss that interview you were looking forward to or the show on your favorite topic. Follow IRN on Twitter, I underscore R underscore N, and get reminders about the evening's live shows as well as fun and important updates throughout the week. That's I underscore R underscore N, and never miss a great show again. Hello, everyone. Tuning in, this is Jamie Havigan for Inception Radio Network. Remember to like our Facebook page. Move past the crossroads in your life and discover alternative solutions to your deepest concerns at SoulHealer.com. So whether it's a physical problem, an emotional issue, a question about work, or troubles in your relationships, naturopath and medical intuitive Dr. Rita Louise can help you. Bring peace, harmony, and health back into your life. Schedule a session today. Visit SoulHealer.com right away and live the life you've been dreaming of. Hello, Inception Radio Network. Would you like your favorite show to be played again live on air? Well, now the choice is in your hands. With IRN's live request portal, an easy way to request your favorite show with a simple click. IRN's live request portal now gives you exclusive access to all the shows. How easy is it? Simply type a show name or a guest name, click request, even write a dedication message, and that's it. Try it now. Simply visit InceptionRadioNetwork.com. Click on the Live Request tab under the Show menu. Now playing your favorite show is just a mouse click away. Hello, IRN listeners. This is MJ saying hello and sharing an awesome secret I discovered. It's called DreamNuage.com. Fresh, raw, organic ingredients are used to create all their products. They are made in very small batches to ensure quality and freshness. Handmade in the USA, each product is created with care and with the finest organic ingredients. 
There are no preservatives, dyes, or chemicals in any product. Stop by Dream Nuage and relax. That's D-R-E-A-M-N-U-A-G-E dot com. Simple, raw, organic. Don't have a computer? Is your internet connection down? Don't worry. Use your trusty cell phone or landline and call into our listen line at 401-283-6700 to listen to the Inception Radio Network 24-7. Again, that call-in number is 401-283-6700. For the Inception Radio Network, I am MJ. Go deep inside yourself and venture into the realm of the unconscious mind with my Meditating on the Kabbalah guided imagery audio CDs. Discover who you are and what you want in life. Meditating on the Kabbalah can help you to open, clear, and revitalize the energetic pathways of your subtle being. They will support you in your spiritual quest by helping you to access the profound insights and inner guidance you need as you work in alignment with your highest good. Let them help you to release negative thoughts and emotions and clear away any limitations that may be keeping you from experiencing your full potential. Walk down the path to health, healing, understanding, and enlightenment with Meditating on the Kabbalah. Order your copy today at www.soulhealer.com. That's right, that's www.soulhealer.com. And now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. Thank you all for staying tuned into the second hour of the show. Uh, Just Energy Radio is brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics, where you can jumpstart your intuition today by downloading their free 50-page guide. It's also brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, energy healings, and psychic readings. And so for anyone who wasn't listening to the show during the first hour, if you are up and around tonight, I'll be on Coast to Coast talking about my books, E.T. Chronicles, What Myth and Legend Has to Say About Human Origins, as well as my new movie, Icon, Deconstructing the Archetypes of the Ancients, still available from Amazon.com for $1.99 digital download. What a bargain! <laughs> Anyway, we've been here talking to Paul Boudreau. His website is www.awhico.com um, about his book, Awakening Higher Consciousness, Guidance from Ancient Egypt and Sumner. Paul, uh, ooh, you know, we got so busy talking and I didn't like organize my thoughts. Um, <laughs> Oh, I know one of the things I wanted to ask you. Um, sure. We've been talking about creation stories mm -hmm. and just about mythology, the, the narrative, and I'm going to say prose, that we find in early, early mythology in that whole creation myth cycle. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I find fascinating and I don't have an explanation for is that um, in, e in the Egyptian creation myths, Mm -hmm. They tend to be written in the first person. You know, I am this and I am this, which really c falls out of convention of what we f find in a lot of other mythic traditions. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Or do you find a difference in the way that that material is being presented? It's the latter. It's the way the, the material is being presented. Uh, the hieroglyphs are such a condensed form of communication uh, there, there's no symbol. There, there's no hieroglyph necessarily for "I am." You know, in terms of you know, "I am God." Or uh, there's, there's generally a, a hieroglyph that one has to uh, to to read in to that hieroglyph, whether it's "I" or "He" or "She" or "It." And this has caused obviously a lot of problems for 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 interpreters. And and it's not my not my expertise, but. Uh, when when we looked at the pyramid texts, the, um, the these pyramid texts were were written 
with a pharaoh in mind, because obviously the pharaoh had constructed the, the, the pyramid complex. And some people translate it as, you know, I am Ra, and some have translated it as Unas is Ra. And they're both valid uh, uh, interpretations of the hieroglyph. So I, I, don't think, I don't think you can read a whole lot into how it's presented. Um, I don't know if you like leaving it open and loosey goosey like that or not, but that's kind of the way they they presented their 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 language and their concepts. Well, I was just wondering from a consciousness point of view if there would be more intrinsic power with the notion of I am or I mm -hmm. versus you know presenting it from a third person where you have to actually step into that other person's shoes. For me, I like I like the I am. I, it, it does make it more direct and more immediate. But I have to be careful. That might just be a personal preference. Uh, uh, the Egyptians, uh, another insight into this, sometimes the Egyptian would, would draw a picture or an image as if you were looking at it, you know, facing it, you know, left and right reversed. And sometimes it presented as if you were looking out from it. So sometimes even the, the hieroglyphs go from left to right, and some go from right to left. So there's all sorts of uh, higher, uh, deeper interpretations for, for the language in terms of how it should be read and how you should look at it uh, that that reflect this. You know, where is the where is the observer in relation to the the message itself? And where we always write left to right, you know, I mean, we, we talked earlier about place markers. Uh, they had a much different view of the world and, and, uh, and their, the relationship of one to the other, you know, a, a thing to another is, is really highly developed. Um, we look at uh, Schwaller de Lubitz, I don't know if you, you know that, that author. Uh, he spent uh, 20 years, I believe, in the Temple of Luxor on the, in, in, in Egypt. And uh, he's written a number of books, some published by Inner Traditions, their publisher. Uh, but one of the interesting things he found is that in, in some cases of the Temple of Luxor, there'd be an image on, on one side of the wall in one room, which required the image on the back side of the wall in the other room to complete the story. Again, it, it, it's beyond my understanding of, of, of Egyptian, but uh, one can get a sense of the complexity of their thought by, by imagining how you would build a, uh, a temple that, that required you to put two pieces together that you could never see at the same time. Uh, uh, very interesting kind of concepts in terms of how you're presenting things that way. So the I, you is, is a similar thing, a similar example of, they got very, very, very complex in their, their representation. Do you find that level of complexity in the pyramid text? Absolutely. The, the, you know, the pyramid texts, well, one of the challenges that, that we address in the book is we look at the pyramid texts as instructions of initiation for a living person. Um, and whereas others have looked at it and said, well, it's just prayers over a dead pharaoh. Um, I'm willing to argue the point, but it's a much more interesting story and much more vital literature to think that it's written for someone that's alive and, and interested in higher planes of consciousness. And, and you know, the netherworld is, is, a, is a real dimensional uh, existence for these higher, higher beings. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, the complexity is, 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 is really quite astounding, considering the, the the compression of higher of information in the hieroglyphs. Uh, one one, if I may, one of the Lloyd and I uh, managed to spend a couple of visits in the uh, king's chamber in the Great Pyramid of uh, of Giza, and uh, uh, we had a moment when there was only two of us in in this special place. I mean, it, it, it's it's uh, a it's a phenomenal room uh, in the middle of this huge pile of, of stone. And we hummed, we hummed uh, a note. And, and 
the whole chamber uh, vibrated. It, it, it felt like the whole world was vibrating with very little, you know, very low hum, uh, very little energy on our part. The whole world seemed to sort of pick up on what we were doing. And, and so that it's another example of the kind of experience that the Egyptians built into their structures is that they could amass this huge mound of stone and yet have it so subtle and so full of energy that, that a simple note could could resonate through all the chamber. So it, I think there's there's much more we still have to learn about the Egyptians and and, uh, and the knowledge they had and, and how they try to convey it, whether it was in the actual architecture, whether it was in the images carved on the wall, whether it was the literature. Uh, there's a huge wealth of information that we're just starting to, to tease out, I think. Well, with the pyramid text, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. wouldn't they, couldn't they have been for the Pharaoh to use in order to help him get into the neither world? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. That's, that makes the most sense that, of all the, the possibilities. Uh, most people don't realize that the pyramid the pyramids were always part of a pyramid complex, and particularly the, the, the pyramid texts were only written in, in 11 of the very earliest pyramids ever built by the Egyptians. But every one was, was the pyramid was, was just part of a larger complex. Um, they were surrounded by a, a wall which, which contained the space. The pyramid itself was always entered through a, a temple which bridged um, which allowed the person or allowed passage from the outside world into the, the walled area and into the pyramid. But fascinatingly enough, the, the, the temple, the pyramid, was connected to the, 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 the riverbank of the Nile by an enclosed causeway. And at the, at the riverside, there was another pyramid, uh, another temple. So what, what we envision is that the pharaoh, the initiate, the, the, the person to be instructed, would arrive uh, on the river to this riverside temple, valley temple, and make their way through an enclosed causeway, which uh, would be about a mile long, I guess. And in, in the case of uh, at least one uh, of the ancient pyramids, uh, the, the Pyramid of Unas, in the, in the ceiling of this enclosed causeway was a slit which would allow the person to look up and see the sky. Um, so the person would arrive by boat, go to the, the, the temple, go up through this causeway looking at the stars. He'd have another uh, temple to pass through before he actually got into the, the pyramid and then on the walls inside the chambers of the pyramid would be written the pyramid text. So. It, it, it makes perfect sense that this would be an initiation sort of process that would uh, be part of the preparation of the Pharaoh for what he was about to read. He, you know, he wouldn't just pull up in his I don't know, sedan chair or something and, and hop in the pyramid. There, there were all these other parts of the journey that would take him from uh, the, the River Nile and then place him inside of the pyramid to be able to, to read these pyramid texts. So. It's very much a, an initiative process that, that would prepare him for, you know, reading these texts, which would not have been open to everybody. You know, there's not, a, I don't think the general public in, in Egypt would have made this journey. I think a number of very select people would. And, uh, and so the pyramid text written on the walls would be, uh, would be just one piece of this whole journey and, and contain just one kind of the kind of information that they would have been exposed to. Well, and the part that I find fascinating is that <clears throat> it was put up, you know, if it, it is some of the earliest writing, but they had a full understanding of vocabulary, they oh, had a yeah. full understanding of grammar, mm -hmm. and, you know, they built where did that all come from? I mean, even the Sumerians, you know, by the time they started writing, it wasn't mm -hmm. like they were just doing chicken scratch. They had a full-blown mm -hmm. system of writing that mm -hmm. just, bang, here it is. <laughs> yeah, well, when, when I say 2,500 years before Christ, you know, that, that, that was the pinnacle. That was, you're right, that was, that was the top. Uh, 
where do they come from? Yeah, we, we don't, you know, there, there's some, some ideas and, and uh, uh, the, the whole idea of, of uh, the, the Gobekli Tepe being uh, tied to a megalithic uh, culture and then the Egyptian being tied to a megalithic culture. Uh, you know, there's <clears throat> 8,000 years between the dating of the, the Gobekli Tepe and, and uh, the building or the, you know, the, the apparent uh, building of the, the Egyptian pyramids. 8,000 years is a long time to, to develop literature, to develop concepts. Uh, you know, it's only been 2,000 years since, I would say, the time of Christ, and we've gone from sandals and donkeys to sending spaceships out. So 8,000 years between Gobekli Tepe and, uh, and ancient Egypt, there's a lot of time there that we, we don't really know what, uh, what was going on. But it just seems like there's a giant void that's the part that's just so frustrating is there's a giant void of nothing or yeah, very little. Very <clears throat> little. Um, my career was a marine biologist and I, I'm curious <laughs> to know uh, how much of, of this void was caused by the, by the melting uh, of the, uh, the glacier and uh, sea level rising by, uh, what, 300 feet or something. Uh, I'm always intrigued to, find, to hear stories about Civilized, evidence of civilization being found you know, 100 feet down under the water and, and that's happened uh, certainly on the west coast of, of North America and such. So that void may actually be underwater. And that's very possible. That's very possible. So, um, yeah, we have a lot to learn and maybe, maybe we'll, we'll, you know, in our lifetime we'll be able to see some of these, uh, some more of this evidence trickle out as to what did happen between between 12,000 years ago and 2,000 years ago, and uh, maybe we'll be able to fill in uh, a few of those uh, missing pieces. Well, unless the levels keep rising like they're doing, and then you know, we'll be able to say goodbye to Miami next. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be buying a property in Miami. No, that's, that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, so, I mean, that 10,000-year perspective, an ice age uh, melting and, and sea level rise uh, gives one a, a deeper appreciation for why there might be a void. And, uh, um, I, I, again, I'm, I'm very interested to see, the, see the, the work done on what I call the pyramid culture, you know, finding pyramids all around the world and trying to date those. And, and uh, yeah, it's an interesting time. Um, let's shift gears again. Sure. And do you think our goal here on Earth is to become more godlike? I said godlike. Godlike, yes, yes. Plotinus was a, a Greek writer, and he actually had a huge influence on Christianity in terms of writing about his understanding of the world and how we are uh, we are all a piece of God and, and we have an inner urge to return to become more like a, a more more godlike if you will um, yeah I think that's tied to awakening that, that uh, that's tied to, to not being asleep um, you know not being a stone not being an animal but being being a man and being something uh, something more alive um, what that means eventually for me when I'm ready to, to, to pass away, I, I don't know, but uh, um, the world is more interesting when, when I ask those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, you know, and the reason that I'm asking that is because when kind of going back to something I said very early in the show, mm -hmm. Some of the stories of the gods, the gods don't seem very god-like. <laughs> well, the Greek gods certainly don't. Uh, Some of the Sumerian ones aren't that great either. <laughs> uh, yeah, they had their quarrels and uh, uh, trying to kill man. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's uh, yeah, I don't know if there's such a thing as a higher gods and lower gods. Uh, you know, my, my moments of awakening are all-encompassing, so th there's no real differentiation there. Um, 
I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what what would, what I would get if I tried to to to, to define those moments of awakening and go, uh, as as godlike and not so godlike. Uh, interesting that Gilgamesh was a demigod. I mean, what's half? What's a demigod? I mean, uh, uh, don't even get me started. <laughs> 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 so yeah, to be be, be more of a person. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I would hate to to be on my deathbed and not think I was alive, even though I know that a lot of times I'm not. Uh, uh, a simple example, I, you know, I've been on those long night journeys where you're trying to drive from one place to another, and the only way to get there is to drive. And uh, it's happened a couple times that um, driving in the middle of the night and all of a sudden waking up, and all of a sudden you're aware that you know what's going on, the lights. Which only asks, begs the question: Well, where was I a few minutes before? Uh, you know, you get. I, I don't know if you had the experience of driving to work, and then all of a sudden you find yourself at work, and you don't remember anything about the drive. Uh, that sort of, those sorts of experience show me that there are levels of consciousness. There are levels of, of being awake. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, another experience. Um, that that uh, explores these levels of consciousness. Uh, I've run marathons, and uh, one summer I was uh, working to qualify for my Boston Marathon, and uh, I took it upon myself to count every step that I ran that whole summer. So, you know, to to qualify, it requires, you know, 50 miles of running a, a week and 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 whatnot, at least that. And I took it upon myself to count every step. So I'd set my watch and I'd count up to 60 and the watch would beep and I'd start again. Uh, several times that summer, uh, I, I don't know if it was grace or luck or, or whatnot, I found myself running running down the, the path and I, I was aware that I was running and breathing and whatnot. And I was aware that I was counting uh, which seemed like a somewhat different task. And to much to my surprise, uh, a complainer, a, you know, a little, you know, the image of an angel and devil on your shoulders, mm -hmm. a little devil appeared on my shoulder to try to talk me out of counting. You know, oh, you've, you've counted enough, you know, that you don't need to do this. You, you've done good, stop counting. And at that moment, there was another awareness of, of all these me's, all these eyes operating within myself. The, the eye that was running, the eye that was counting, the, the eye that was being the devil. And for just a few brief moments, life seemed totally different. It was like, my God, all this is going on in me, and I, I wasn't aware of it. Um, I would love to be able to live with that level of awareness for longer. I, I might go crazy. <laughs> Maybe I would be crazy. But it was it was fascinating to 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 see. Uh, I guess it would be like a mantra: this counting, uh, sort of engaging enough of my ego so that these other sides w w could make themselves so clearly uh, visible to me. So another example of, of of my own personal experience of of higher conscious but lower consciousness as well, that really convinced me that, that yeah, I'm not awake much, I'm not, I, I spend most of my time asleep and, and I think it, it is incumbent on me to try to be asleep less, try to be more awake and more aware. If that's godlike, I don't know, but that, that's, that, that's the goal. Any thoughts on why we can't be in that state all the time or more often and why it tends to come on like a fleeting moment and then disappears from our existence until the next moment next blinding glimpse of the obvious I, yeah. you know, I, I've read a lot of people and no one seems to explain that quite no, well, no one seems to explain it. Plotinus, again, I mentioned, he, he sort of states it as kind of inevitable that you'll have a moment of grace and then then you have to, you, I don't know if he said you have to go back or you do go back. Uh, you know, it's like Gilgamesh falling asleep by the pool. It, there seems to be something natural in it that I, I, I really don't understand yet. Falling asleep by the pool? 
<laughs> have, have, have my goal snatched out of my hand as I sleep by the pool, much like Gilgamesh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was laced. The pool was laced, and it just, you know, knocked him out, and, <laughs> yeah, know, and then the snake came. Maybe life, maybe life is laced with with sleeping pill or something. We we just we just are more comfortable being asleep when when part of us doesn't want to be asleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, but the concept of having the serpent take it away, you know, takes us back to that whole notion of you know bad or evil or that thing too. Yeah. You know, like this is his dream, this is what he really wants, and now it's being but, taken away. But there's something natural about it. I mean, it, it again, I, I seem to like being asleep. The snake is just doing what he's doing. Uh, I just don't have what it takes to stay awake to get that flower of immortality back home with me. Uh, or, or maybe I have to try again. Maybe it's lining me up for my next next big uh, hero adventure to try to uh, accomplish what I say is my goal, even though I'm not very adequate to the task. Maybe that's the basis of the hero stories, is to remind myself that, yeah, there is a hero down there somewhere. <laughs> maybe with time and effort that might just help me someday make it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the Star Wars, you know, image of, you know, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking of like, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings and they're on the rock and, the you know, they're outside of Mordor and Sam and uh, mm -hmm. Frodo are on the rock, you know, talking about, do you think they'll tell stories about us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, it's a bit of a distraction, but I, I saw somewhere online, I think, that, uh, yeah, it was online, someone suggesting that, why didn't the eagles just fly them there? And I thought, oh, come on, that would be a crappy myth if, you know, this big higher power just flew them over to Mordor and dropped the ring at them. You needed all that, that, that fighting and, you know, all, all that other process to, to make the story, to make, to make it what it is. Uh, Three books long. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit long, but yeah, you know, the Netherworld, uh, another similar uh, concept by the, by the Egyptians and Sumerians. You know, this 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 process that 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 you've got to prepare for, and you've got to wear the right clothing, and you've got to remember the right verses, and then when you go down through the Netherworld, you know you're going to be challenged, and if you've got enough awareness to remember your lessons, and and you get through all the gates, and out you come the other end. A much better person. Well, you don't have to go through that netherworld process, but the end result is something we should be dream should be aiming for. So, uh, you know, why all the drama? It seems part of the part and parcel of the of the of the process that's going on. Do you think we need to go through the netherworld in order to emerge, uh, reborn on the other side? Do you think that that needs to be part of the process? I think so, yeah. If you, you know, without effort, there's no reward. Uh, there seems to be some requirement to be uh, tempered by, by those challenges to, you know, test your mettle to make sure you are a hero, that you do have what's required uh, to be a, a higher person, a different person. And without the process, you're 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 not going to make it. Well, and I think there's like a cleansing part that would have to come out of the challenges. You know, you hear the stories of the underworld or the neither world, and there are all these obstacles and challenges that mm -hmm. need to be faced and addressed mm -hmm. before you can. You know, as in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, you know, mm. be weighed against book of coming the forth by Book by coming forth by day, please. Yeah, that one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> it was kind of a boring read. I'm sorry. The Tibetan <laughs> Book of the Dead was much, much more interesting. Oh, was it? I haven't read that one. Have well, the Tibetan Book of the Dead addresses more of how you help a spirit get into the light and let the, the spirit know that it's dead. 
and that it can move on. Okay. I mean, it was really, it was a totally different take on the dead topic, you know, where the other one seemed like it was more of a purging and, you know, getting through obstacles so that you can emerge victorious on the other side. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, emerge different, emerge mm-hmm. dif- in, a, in a different state. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and, you know, the preparation for the journey through the netherworld is important as the journey. And, and uh, yeah, you, you, you have to train. You have, it's, none of this is easy. If it was easy, I guess we'd all be floating around on clouds. Uh, what, why, why the netherworld challenges are so essential is, is the same kind of question as, um, you know, why, why would I want to be awake? Uh, is it for everybody? Eh, maybe not, but for me, yeah, it's enough. It's important enough to at least keep in the back of my mind when I'm going through my, my daily sleep routines. But it seems like only people that successfully navigate the neither world will emerge on the other side. It's not that everybody can go through, and if you don't make it through, you get relegated to wherever. Mm. Yeah, I don't know where the average person goes. I, I, yeah, the, the, pro, the, the, the journey through the nether world I don't see is for everybody. Uh, it's like joining the Marines, you know, and you have to do that, like, training where you stand in the ice-cold water with all the guys holding a log for, like, three days. It's like, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they they get something out of there. it. I, I bet you they get something out of it. Uh, yeah, that is spiritual training and, and, and challenges, I guess, have been around. We, we see it in, in the literature we look at. It's always been around, so... Obviously, humans are, I don't know if they're predetermined to sort of take on these silly challenges or not, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not programmed to just lie around and do nothing. Mm-hmm. At least not now. So do you think that this deeper level was important to our ancestors to explore their consciousness? Or do you think these stories were encoded so that when the time was right, we could utilize them? Mm, don't think it has to be one or the other. Certainly, it was important to them, and you know, it's like raising your kids. A connection with this is beyond the personal. So uh, I, uh, there's always that uh, uh, that awareness of something more, something down the road. But we know we're not going to live in this form forever. Uh, whether we get reincarnated or live as ghosts, we have to accept that, that life is changing and is going to go on. Uh, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to, 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 to speculate on, on whether they were doing it for themselves or, or for others. I'd probably average it and say probably a little bit of both. See, the part that gets me is there obviously was this level of importance to these stories. But if the stories were fictitious, you know, and they were just these fairy tales, even though there was a deeper part to it, Mm -hmm. um, then why go through the trouble of documenting them? Um, Case in point, the pyramid text. They didn't just document it. They carved these bloody things on stone in the middle well, that's of... that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, obviously... I mean, you know, you wouldn't want to put, like, a Danielle Steele novel in there or Stephen <laughs> King. I mean, why bother if it was just something that you made up and there's not value? I mean, there's value to these things. The, the idea that, that this initiation, if we will, for the pharaoh was critical to civilization is is probably not far off the the belief system and and we say in our book that that myths are critical to the development of civilization those belief systems are are, are the cornerstone of what what happens to the civilization how how they view the world um, there's a book by William Sull- Sullivan on the Inca I don't know if you encountered this uh, where he, he looks at the Incan myths about the Milky Way and, and the stars as uh, a predeterminant to why the Incas 
uh, fell to the conquistadors. There was like, what, 140 conquistadors sail up on a ship, as mm-hmm. opposed to tens of thousands of Incas. Uh, and, and Sullivan does an excellent job of teasing apart their myths to, to show that they, all, they were expecting the end of their world. And for this reason, 140 Europeans were able to totally put an end to the civilization. So that's an example of, of, of the, the power of myth, the role of myth. And, you know, if, if, if it was critical to your civilization that the pharaoh had to go through this process of, you know, arriving at the, the, the Nile temple and going to the causeway and, and getting into the pyramid and properly prepared read the pyramid text on the wall, if that was critical to how you viewed the world, then then one can appreciate that they would put all that effort into it. Uh, it's not tangible from our point of view why that would happen, but it sure, it sure was important to them. Um, maybe the culture then could appreciate the results of that initiation more than we do now. The First Nations people in North America, you know, the, the shaman was a very special person, a key to the to the survival of the civilization. So I think it's on that level that that uh, that you have to appreciate what what a civilization does is based on the myth. I mean, heck, we're sending spaceships out past Pluto. We're buying into that that modern myth that that's useful to do. May not be. May be viewed by different other different civilizations differently, but certainly that's what we are doing, and, and uh, maybe that's that's our own uh, way of uh, writing down our, our our legacy to future. I think our legacy to the future is going to be their belief that we worship the golden the god of the golden arches. <laughs> There's a lot of <clears throat> lot of golden arches around that That's support, right. and you that know support. Well, no, but I just figure in five thousand years, you know, when they start digging around, it won't be destroyed because it's styrofoam and it's not biodegradable. <laughs> yeah, the ink will still be readable. Yeah, that's yeah, that, right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm kind of scary. I, I mean, hopefully we get. Hopefully, there's still people around in five thousand years. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, when the poodles take over the planet and they start digging around and, you know, archaeologically. Um, <laughs> well, is it, uh, beetles don't, aren't killed with, with nuclear radiation. So th- there's always hope. There's always hope. Ooh, a bug, <laughs> a bug infested world. <laughs> we, should, we should do a movie. <laughs> That's okay. I won't go see it. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. The, the Egyptians put a lot of effort into the the pyramid text, and and uh, it makes more sense to 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 us, and if we look at it in terms of initiation and, and getting the highest out of at least a, a select group of Egyptians that knew more about life, you know, could participate more in life, could keep civilization going. I, I, I don't know, but uh, impressive pieces of work and, and on top of just having to, those big rocks. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, do you think that myth, myth and mythology has shaped society and culture? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I think we're living... I think we're living with the myth of progress right now. Uh, I'm, what do you I'm mean not, by that? Well, uh, uh, the the uh, we we feel that that we're getting better with each passing day. When we look at when we look at the myths and some of the the concepts they contain, some of the rocks they moved, uh, that that idea of getting better every day with each passing year is is a little harder to. Uh, to accept it, at least you have to accept that there were peaks and valleys in, in our development. So now we we live as a, a sort of an engineered society that you know if we can do if we can engineer it better, it, it we're better off. Whereas the the metaphysical, the spiritual side is is not quite not a, not as uh, actively supported. Um, you know we we're building this huge. Uh, 
uh, hadron, large hadron collider in CERN and, and to smash atoms together. But, you know, there's a lot of other things we could be doing with our time and our money that, uh, that may be more profitable in the long run than, than smashing atoms together. Okay. Um, but, I mean, do you think stories like the Epic of Gilgamesh has fostered a thought or a belief or concepts that we are utilizing principles that we find in narratives like that to live on today. I mean, I know that biblical narratives definitely have influenced the direction and course mm -hmm. that society has moved forward in, you know, in the Western world. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes for the better, some sometimes for the worse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're all taught mathematics and we're taught, you know, uh, chemistry and biology and whatnot and accounting. Uh, we, we don't have similar, you know, attention paid to our spiritual beings and, and our, our development. So that's a sign of our civilization that we, we just don't pay that enough attention. And we have a hard time appreciating other civilizations that, uh, the other, other cultures that do that. So... Uh, uh, whether it could change, I'm not sure. Uh, civilizations do come and go, and there's lots of examples, Inca, Mayan, Egyptian. So uh, uh, what the long-term end goal of Western civilization is, I'm not sure. Well, we don't know either, and we live here. Yep, we vote, we pay taxes, and <clears throat> we don't complain too much. Well, I... Yes, we do. Oh, do we? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> you must not have a Facebook account. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, those are little complaints. That's not real changing the world complaints. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at the clock. We have, I'm going to say like 10 minutes. Um, something that we talked about a little bit, um, but not really was the concept of ritual, you know, and I want to expand that to magic and ritual. Mm -hmm. um, in these early cultures, it seems like the concept of magic and ritual take a very important role. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think that? Well, in, in the Egyptian, there was this balance between the god, the netter, and the principle of magic, and, and the, the god, the netter of, uh, of mat. Mat is order, order, justice, truth sort of thing. The, in modern day world, we like order. We like, you know, we like logic. We're run by our minds, and, and we undervalue the role of magic. But as a biologist, you know, there's still a lot of intangible things that happen in life that that really are hard to explain on the basis of atoms or molecules or, you know, the rational order, you know, physical order that we live in. So I I, I see more I see magic as a useful term to describe a lot of these intangibles that, that we encounter in our day that that has has no other, other no other meaning. I mean, you know, the magic of life or the magic of death. You know, what what happens from a living state to a uh, dying state. Uh, I think you could probably trace that back to Christianity. Christianity really didn't like magic, and and uh, they saw magic as bad magic and against them. And so it's been really uh, taken out of Western culture, such the point that you know. It, it's not very well recognized. It's not even suitable to sort of have a discussion on magic. But yet there are these intangibles in life that, that we have to recognize. You know, love makes the world go round. You know, people live and die for, for love. And what role those intangibles play in our life are important to recognize. And I, I would call that magic. I'll, I'm not sure if that's the magic that you would be talking, that, that you conceive of, but it's more than entertainment, more than, you know, a sleight of hand. I think it's a real, real uh, process that, that exists. Well, I mean, Jesus did magic. Oh, wait, those were miracles. That's right. <laughs> wait, but they both start with M, so that's close, right? Um, 
I mean, that's the part that I think is interesting is that Jesus was able to do these feats, um, which, you know, they don't they don't really like tell how he did them. He just did them. Mm -hmm. But it seems like it's almost as if they don't want anybody else doing it because then it deters or takes away from Jesus's ability to mm -hmm. transcend. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know? you've got to make your local hero hero special somehow, and if you can't, well, I guess you do both. You you build them up, and you you make sure that there's no opposition. So, um, miracles, yeah, they're magic, but I think there's things closer to us that you know the, uh, the again the, the the feeling that you have when you see a beautiful sunset. To me, those are those are kind of day to day magic things that that uh, we don't really appreciate enough. But when you experience something like that, I mean, it puts you back in or closer to that divine state, to that feeling of higher consciousness that you were talking about earlier. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah, would would a uh, would a nice sunset be better than, or watching a nice sunset every evening be better than a six-figure salary? Uh, possibly, it might make you, you might live longer, um, but it does make you feel different. And, and I, there's no, I don't think there's any, any, any way that you could describe it better than magic. I mean, an MRI or, you know, a brain scan might tell you which electrons are, are firing, but to my knowledge, no one, um, as making any progress in terms of, of really capturing what, 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 what is the evidence for higher consciousness, higher awareness, you know, with all this technology we have. So magic, I think, deserves a bit more uh, uh, respect in our civilization. Much like, you know, a shaman or, you know, the, 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 just because we don't understand it doesn't mean it doesn't influence us and doesn't uh, improve our lives. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, yeah, I mean, that was kind of what I was thinking was the whole shaman type idea where they are able to do things or, you know, you hear these uh, about these uh, yogis in mm -hmm. India who are able to, I don't know, create rose petals or whatever they do, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, and just manifest them mm -hmm. just. You know, I don't want to say through their will, but by connecting with some unknown, some seen, unseen force in the universe. I mean, I don't think that they would, you know, have like a little secret slide in their, you know, jacket that would <laughs> make little rose petals appear, you know, on command kind um, of thing. That, yeah, that would be a bit silly, but... Uh, are you aware of uh, Paul Brunton? Paul Brunton uh, did some studies in India and, and the Middle East. And uh, one of his books, he writes about a, a mystic, uh, a, uh, I should have dug out the book, Tyron Bray, I think the name might be. And, and this would have been the early 1900s. And, and this Bray, I think that's the right name, uh, could go into a trance and, and he was buried, you know, they buried him for like 48 hours in an airtight coffin and he, they opened up the coffin and he was awake and then they could, you know, put pins into him. Um, uh, he's, the story seems to imply he had a connection with a, a way of operating that we don't and, and it seemed very well documented by scientists at the time, and, and they, they did it under controlled conditions, and uh, this, uh, I guess it'd be a fakir, or, or I think might, that might be the right term, was able to do incredible things uh, beyond what the normal human could do. I've got no reason to doubt the, the, the observations that were made. I wish I could do that. It, it, I have no idea what kind of thing he was tapping into, but it certainly again gives some uh, some insights into what our capacity is. If we were different, if we were better, if we were more awake, I, I don't know. Well, and I, I guess I bring that up because I, if I recall, in like autobiography of a yogi, 
um, he was able to maybe not do that, but it was able to do a lot of different things. And it was all because he was able to tap into that unknown, unseen, you know, energy that mm -hmm. exists, mm -hmm. you know, and that was just a byproduct of him being able to tap into it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Magic. Yeah. I, I... Well, I mean, that's what we call it. You know, some people will call it a miracle. I like calling it a miracle because it sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's fine, it, it, but the, it gives us something to look, look, something to strive for. Uh, you know, life life can be different, and, and uh, um, I, might even be better. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, do you think by tapping into our higher consciousness that? we end up being better do you think that over time if enough people tap into their higher consciousness that society would be better that kind of thing yeah both both uh, I, I can i can speak more from personally yes when i have those moments of awakening life is better and it's easy to imagine that if many people lived like that society might be better See, it just makes me wonder if we were in those kind of moments more often, would we really care about the big house and the fancy car and all of the things that we surround ourselves with in contemporary society? Or would we just let them go because they'd really become unimportant? They'd become unimportant. Uh, there's a, a number of people writing these days about happiness. Uh, what makes us happy? Uh, they're finding certain basic, you know, levels of income and health that are required. But beyond that, the, the happiness that comes out from, you know, a six-figure salary and a big house and a, and, a, and a big car really don't justify the effort we put into it. I don't think we have alternative things to put our effort into, and that may be one of the problems of, of our society is that we're not given these other alternatives. But how big a car do you need? Uh, you know, uh, you know how big how big a, a a plot of land? Even even in the nineteenth century, you could see that those standards changed based on what we were taught and and how our neighbors performed. And, you know, the, the the single family home with a, a, a two car garage sort of came after World War Two, and it's sort of accepted. Um, I mean, uh, I love the idea that New York City is is one of the most ecologically friendly areas in the world because of the density of people and the ability to handle people in, in New York City. But uh, when you talk to most Westerners, it's, oh, no, I want an acre of land and a, and a, and a car and a, and a house. Uh, yeah, we, we can change our, our, our desires and, and we could be happy with other things. What would make us make those changes, I don't know yet. I don't know, but I think we need to do something. Do you have to sit in traffic to carpool to work? Maybe a... No, my commute consists of going downstairs, getting something to drink, and walking <laughs> back upstairs. That's my commute these days as well. <laughs> but for all the time people spend in cars and traffic jams, you'd think that someone would, would realize that maybe that's not the best way to live your life. Yeah. Mm. But I think that that's changing, and I think more and more people are trying to get out of that. But I'm looking at the clock. We need to wrap. Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it catches me by surprise sometimes. Um, if someone wants your book, Amazon, where's yep. the best place? Uh, well, the, our website has links to Amazon or Barnes & Noble, or you could buy a Kindle version on Amazon. So again, the, the, the website awhico.com or do a Google search on awhico. And uh, yeah, we've got Twitter, Facebook. We're easy to find, hopefully. Easy to find. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on and um, spending time with us today. What a great chat. Good fun. Well, all right. Yeah. All right. Well, you have a great weekend, and I am sure I will talk to you again soon. I look forward to it. Take care, okay. Dr. Rita. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. That's Paul Boudreau. His book is Awakening Higher Consciousness. His webpage is awhico.com. 
Next week, we're going to be having Nick Pope and maybe a couple other people on talking about Rendlesham Forest UFO encounter. Till next time, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Be blessed. Join host Dr. Rita Louise each week at this time for Just Energy Radio.